So my name is Jeff Scudder, and we're going to be talking today about uh, creating a Google Data API client, right? We've got all these Google Data APIs, and uh, the one thing that's left up to you is writing uh, some kind of software that integrates with all these different services that talks to all these different uh, applications that we have on the, on the web. Um, and so how do you go about doing that? Specifically, how do you go about creating a library uh, maybe that other people can use, something that's reusable, uh, something that solves problems in a broad and reusable way. And uh, so I'm going to be talking about a few different themes, some sort of ideas. As I'm going through this, I'm going to talk about several different topics and key components. But the main things to come back to are the Atom Pub requirements, uh, some of the lessons learned. Um, I actually wrote one of the... Uh, libraries that, uh, that Google promotes as one of the official open source client libraries and it happened to be in Python. Um, so I've learned a few things as I've done that. Hopefully I can share some things and save you guys some trouble if you're thinking about either writing applications or writing libraries that uh, you know, will be reusable. And uh, the last aspect I want to highlight is community and the idea of uh, writing an open source application and all of the benefits that that can, uh, you know, bring to you and to your application and um, to the world at large. So let's go ahead and start by talking a little bit about Atom Pub. So these uh, APIs that I'm talking about, I'm sort of assuming that everybody knows what I'm talking about when I say Google Data APIs. Um, so there's a, a list of services that we provide, and they use this uh, open standard called Atom Pub, which is a RESTful web service design that uses, uh, uh, talks about using resources, right? You, you have uh, some kind of uh, encapsulated piece of data, and you're performing CRUD operations on it. You're adding new data, you're uh, retrieving it, you're updating it, you can delete things, remove things. So a good example of this is uh, one of the first services that we had that used Atom Hub uh, was Blogger. Um, so we're going to be talking about that a little bit. Um, when we're talking about Atom Pub, I like to think of it as three pieces when we're talking about Google Data Services specifically. Um, and as I wrote the library, I actually broke it down, uh, divided along these lines. You have auth, where you have to uh, authenticate and authorize uh, you know, your application to have access to the user's data. Uh, the next piece is that uh, in order to carry out those CRUD operations, we actually use HTTP calls where, you know, your computer or client application or server, wherever your code is running, sends an HTTP request to Google's servers. And uh, what they're sending back and forth in those HTTP requests is XML. So it's often helpful to have, you know, things like XML parsers, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so let's talk about one particular use case. Uh, let's say we wanted to post on your blog. Let's say you have a blog on blogger.com. Blogger.com exposes a Google Data API. So uh, you can post a new post without ever touching the Blogger UI. You just, uh, you know, write some code, or in this case, what I'm going to show is a, a curl script first. Um, and then what we want to do is display a link to the content. So I've already mentioned that I'm going to show curl, and uh, the reason I wanted to highlight that is because, you know, we have these APIs. Uh, it's a RESTful design. It's supposed to be simple, right? It wouldn't seem like you need a lot of code to get started. You don't need to write a whole big library in order to use these services. You can start with something very small. So there's sort of a question as to why you would even need a client library at all. Um, you know, so starting off, we're going to uh, authenticate, which uh, is going to involve a uh, post uh, uses HTTPS because we're going to be sending the username and password uh, across the wire and exchanging that for a token. Um, then we need to do a second post, which is actually when we're sending the Atom uh, XML for that blog post. And uh, we include the token we received earlier so that it knows that we're, uh, our application is authorized as that user. And then we're going to parse the response. We're going to find uh, what's called an alternate link, right? In the XML that you get back once you've posted, um, you know, there's a lot of extra information that the server has added. One of those is a link where you can see the post on blogger.com. 
uh, on Blogspot, actually. Um, so let's look at this curl example. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is uh, authenticate. So here we're making one cur curl request, and uh, you know here I've specified the client login URL, and uh, I have to construct a post body which contains the email password, the account type, the uh, source, which is some kind of identifier that uh, says which application this is. Um, and then uh, we're saying which service we want to authenticate with, which is Blogger in this case. And then uh, the thing that we get back is, is uh, a series of uh, key value pairs. We're interested in one particular one. It starts with uh, auth equals. So we're using grep there to process the response. And then we're going to uh, slice off the beginning to just get that uh, token there at the end. Um, so this is just a command line. Uh, example, you know, no, no real code that we had to write. We could just sit there at the command line and do all this. So now that we have the token, we're looking at the uh, content we're going to send. So here's my blog post that I'm going to send. Here's my Atom XML. And I've just formatted this by hand. I just wrote it in and uh, stored it in a file called uh, blogpost.xml. Um, so uh, let me jump back one slide here. Uh, you can see up at the top, I'm storing this token that I get back in, a, in an environment variable, a shell environment variable. And uh, then I'm going to use that when I actually post. So I'm making it an HTTP post. I'm sending it to this uh, blogger.com feeds you know, with my blog ID to say which blog I'm going to post it to. And then I say that my uh, data is coming out of the, uh, the file here. So let me just show this real quick. I have this uh, command line sample here. So um, let's see, if I look at this uh, curl example, this is the, the two steps here, and then I have a file for the, uh, for the XML that I'm sending. So here's my first step where I'm authenticating, and my second step when I'm making the post. So if I run this here, I, I'm also running in verbose mode, so you get to see all the nice uh, HTTP uh, information being sent back and forth. Um, so what we get back is going to be the XML that the uh, server has sent back as part of the response. And if we uh, look over here at my blog, for example, I have this uh, test blog. Here's the content right now, my latest blog post here. Um, so I'm going to refresh because I just posted to this one. So now we should see my knock-knock uh, my -knock joke that I just posted here. Okay, so now we saw the response there, and, and we said we were interested in one particular link, right, so that we could see, just take that link, follow it, go directly to that new blog post. Um, so here's the XML that we get back, and I've highlighted the information that we're interested in in blue. And, uh, you know, earlier I was using grep to process things. I'm not really sure if there's a good command line tool to... Uh, to process XML. There probably is, but I, I really didn't know of one. So I, I sort of gave up at this point and decided, you know, maybe it would be really nice to, uh, to use some kind of a tool to, uh, to use XML. But, uh, you know, we'll get back to that. Um, let's talk a little bit about this uh, Python client, right? So uh, I saw this need, you know, maybe it would be nice to be able to work with things in, uh, in Python instead of just doing command line. and might be a little bit nicer to uh, do some things like, for example, authenticating. Um, so here's my, uh, my authentication code if I wanted to just, uh, you know, start off starting authenticate with Blogger and I do this uh, programmatic login happens to be what I called this, uh, this method that makes that request in the background. Um, and then I'm preparing the content. Here I'm constructing it in terms of Python objects instead of doing the XML. Uh, it's, you know, not a huge time savings, but down there at the bottom I have these nice add labels thing, which uh, sort of takes a lot of XML. I'm putting in category tags if I'm just doing XML. So that sort of does it for me. And then when I want to do a post, it's pretty simple. It's just uh, saying client post, and here's the object I'm sending. And, you know, these are the, the sorts of things that, uh, you know, the benefit that you can gain from working in it, making it feel more like a native language as opposed to a, uh, you know, just working with the raw XML. So um, 
I wrote this up in a, in a quick Python script. This is everything together and also the import statements and things like that. So uh, down here I'm going to, uh, these last few ones, I'm constructing the, uh, the content here and then I'm posting it and then I'm printing out this uh, alternate link that I want to get. Uh, the library is handling the parsing and uh, figuring out which link is the alternate link and things like that. So uh, if I run that here, Should just handle it all for me and print out this nice link. Yep, there we go. Um, and I can either follow this or I can just hop over to my uh, my blog again and refresh this. I should see my new and improved knock knock joke. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so there's a uh, one example of uh, something that you can do, right, using these Google Data APIs and sort of a way that the client library makes it a little easier to follow what's going on. Um, you know, for example, to parse the XML, I just had to do this right here, um, which is kind of nice. And uh, let's look at another use case. And one of the other uh, library uh, services that we offer and expose a Google Data API for is the uh, contacts API. So for example, if you're in Gmail, you know, that keeps a list of contacts, everybody you've exchanged email with, and uh, you can add new contacts and you can sort of manage the whole, the whole system through this API. Um, so let's say I wanted to edit the name in a Gmail contact. So I'm going to be following similar steps to before. The one step that's different is uh, I'm going to authenticate as before. Then I'm going to get a contact. So I have to retrieve the XML first, and then I'm going to modify just the name and send it back. And uh, then, you know, that sending back is done with, a, with an HTTP put. Um, so now in this example, I think more so in the first example, you start to see the need for having a client library or the benefit that you can gain by having one and, uh, you know, having it be built in such a way that components are reusable because I can take a lot of the code that I wrote for Blogger and reuse it here. Um, but first, you know, let's, uh, let's look at this example contact. All right, so here we see an XML entry and uh, what we want to modify is the part that I've made bold there, that title. Um, so at this point here, I'm going to dive into the, the three topics that I'm talking about. Here is sort of the end of the introduction and bringing you into the uh, how are we going to um, take these three pieces of doing authentication, XML, and uh, you know how are we going to get the community involved in this process of uh, uh, thinking about you know the different components that we need in this library. And I'm going to start by talking about the XML. So if we're thinking about XML, uh, here are some high-level technical details, things that are true across all of the Google Data APIs. If you look at any of the XML we do, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, encoded in UTF-8 encoding. And uh, it uses XML namespaces. And uh, it's a really good idea to preserve unknown markup. So when you're thinking about uh, different libraries or tools that you want to use to interact with XML, Having these three uh, requirements in mind uh, can help a long way in, in making a decision or evaluating different technologies. Uh, so for example, I know of a few XML libraries, uh, some of the older ones that uh, don't preserve namespaces or, or don't really understand them. Um, but let's start with this idea of preserving unknown, unknown markup because this might seem a little bit strange um, to you guys. Uh, you know, why, why would you need to keep what you don't understand? If something is not really useful to you, why would you preserve it uh, when you're bringing down the XML and parsing it and, and doing whatever you need to to encode it? Um, the, real, the, the first big area where this is important is when you're doing updates, when you're doing puts. The idea is that when you do an HTTP put and you're sending this Atom XML, that you can think of that as a complete replacement for the XML that was there before. Um, so uh, the other 
big benefit to this is future proof. If you have some kind of parser that keeps track of each individual element that you're interested in, what happens if later on in the service, you know, we add some new uh, elements into that entry or some new pieces of information that maybe you hadn't seen before? Um, you know, those things might get lost then if you're if you're not uh, if you're not preserving those. So here's our example again. Uh, if we're thinking about doing this process of changing the name here, let's say we got this contact down, so we have this, uh, this XML for this entry. And uh, we're just interested in the bold part, uh, but down at the bottom you can see there's this, uh, there's this email element. And, uh, you know, we don't really know what that is, or, you know, maybe we don't really care. We're just interested in the, uh, in the name. So say we're using a... Uh, just a bare bones atom parser. Let's say you had some kind of library that just did atom. It didn't pay any attention to these uh, these extra elements that we've uh, we've added in. Um, so you know when you're sending it back, you've dropped the email element and you're just sending the new title. And uh, you know you've kept the standard atom parts, but you you didn't really worry about the email. Um, well, what actually happened in the server is that uh, you actually just erased that email from that uh, from that contact. So, you know, uh, maybe you're just interested in changing the title, but you need to send everything that you originally uh, received when you when you pulled down that entry. Um, so this is one of the big gotchas, or one of the big things that I recommend keeping in mind. You know, if you're if you're writing any kind of library or code that interacts with this uh, with this XML. Um, so at the minimum, I would recommend you know if you're looking at XML parsers, use one that's namespace aware. Um, uh, another thing that you can uh, do if you're if you're interested is convert XML to and from native language constructs, in other words, objects, right? If you're working in an object-oriented language, um, so you know this this is generally more usable for people. You know, people are used to working in the language, uh, doing things in a way that makes sense in that language. Uh, oftentimes, XML, you know, depending on the language or the library, may or may not be very user-friendly to the programmer. And there may also be efficiency implications of uh, sort of uh, working with XML as opposed to native objects. Um, so this first point, uh, paying attention to namespacing using a namespace aware parsers. We'll look at this XML here. You can look at XML on the left and on the right. And uh, what do you think? Are these the same? How many people think they are? And how many think they're not? There's a few, right? So uh, the same and not the same is actually kind of a murky gray area. So. It's not the same because some of the elements are in a different order. For example, category is, uh, you know, in the same place, but title and email are reversed. And uh, then, you know, these things actually have the same namespaces. They're just, you know, in one case we're using namespace prefixes and in others we're relying on a default namespace um, to, to declare the namespace that that tag belongs under. Um, so. From the perspective of the server, these two are actually treated exactly the same. So what I mean is when you send either one of these two entries, you're going to have the same data represented uh, on the server in the user interface. You know, we're looking at this uh, contact, for example. Uh, same email address, same name, you know. So now let's talk about the Python-specific solution. I mentioned that we need a, uh, a namespace-aware parser, and it's a good idea to have this be efficient since uh, you're probably going to be processing a large amount of XML. Um, you know, it's one of the main parts of the uh, interaction. So I used element tree, uh, specifically C element tree, but, you know, it's the, the same uh, sort of design. Um, and then that was the, the first step. On top of element tree, I added in a hierarchy of classes. So there's actually one class that corresponds to each XML element that I'm interested in. And uh, if there's something that I didn't anticipate or didn't really understand, um, there's also these uh, extension element uh, objects and extension attributes that sort of uh, take all this unanticipated XML 
and convert it into objects and keep those uh, inside of the entry or the feed or whatever object we have um, so that that uh, markup is uh, preserved. Uh, another thing that's useful about this is, you know, I was talking about writing uh, code for Blogger specifically. You could actually use that same code with contacts. The idea would be things like email, which isn't really a part of the Blogger schemas, um, would end up in one of these extension elements if you were looking at uh, if you were looking at contacts feeds. So you know, there's there's sort of this general solution that you can use in multiple different places. Um, so here's another uh, another benefit of uh, you know using this XML parsing in terms of you know code readability, code reuse, things like that. Right here we have the XML, and when we were talking before, uh, you know about Blogger, uh, we talked about finding specific things. Let's say in this example, I wanted to find the, uh, the Blogger profile um, URI, the the web page where you can view the person's profile. Uh, so. In order to find that doing element tree, you know, you can convert that XML string into uh, into some kind of element tree object, and then you could tra traverse the DOM. Element tree is, uh, you know, has a DOM processor in it, and this is one of the ways you could traverse it. Um, I think it's kind of nice. I sort of worked with that before, but it's a little bit, you know, it's kind of verbose, and there's a lot of things there. You're, you're doing find all the entries and find all the authors, and then find just the first URI and then get the text note of that. Well, we could take this and by converting it into Python objects, you can, uh, you can sort of streamline this process into something that's a little bit easier to read, right? So um, we're saying we want a, uh, an atom feed from this string, and we get back an object from that uh, transformation uh, function there. And then, you know, th those uh, objects actually have uh, members in them. So we're just uh, traversing it by saying a feed has multiple entries. We want the first one, you know, and so on. So um, I thought this was a, a pretty nice improvement in terms of usability and in terms of readability. Um, so let's talk about this idea of defining objects for XML elements, right? So sort of what I did, and I'll go into how I did that a little bit later, but you know, we have to consider some pros and cons to this approach, right? One of the nice things is that if you have all these different classes, right, usually uh, different languages that you're using, um, you'll have something like Javadocs or uh, PyDocs in, in the example of Python, some kind of, you know, automated um, documentation that you can generate them, which will help, you know, developers read about these different uh, different elements and understand the relationships and the hierarchy. Um, Python also has this really nice help function where you can call, uh, you know, in, in your code you have these uh, documentation strings and when you call help on a particular object or a particular class, it gives you the documentation um, from the code there. So uh, that was pretty handy. That was one other benefit. Um, and you can also do things like introspection, you know, if you have uh, different objects that you're looking at, you know, debugging uh, tools and things like that can be helpful. And um, as you saw in the previous slide, it generally makes code a little more compact. Uh, the only problems are you have to define a lot of classes. If you're going to try and convert the entire, you know, Atom uh, corpus and all of the Google data, you know, elements that we've defined and, and all the schemas and things into objects, it's, it's kind of a lot of work. And, uh, you know, it could also lead to a, a larger library. So this is, you know, a point where you have to make a decision and decide, you know, does this make sense for you? Is this something that you're interested in? Um, you know, you have XML parsing and then you have the next level of uh, sort of creating all these different classes and things so, um, so it represents the XML for you. Um, so with the Python library, we went ahead and decided to do this uh, class level um, conversion. So here's a, a kind of a long slide, but uh, I'm talking about four basic ideas. The uh, first solution I thought of, the original today's solution, and maybe something we'll think about for the future. I'm not sure. Um, so in the solution zero, I say zero because this never actually saw the light of day. This was when I had first started working on this. The idea that I had was, okay, you have this XML, you're parsing it using element tree, you get these objects, why not just create these uh, generic dynamic objects? The idea would be, you know, whenever you say 
uh, feed.entry, it just looks in that feed object for anything that's called entry, you know, looks in the XML. And, uh, you know, that was okay, but, uh, you know, some of the, the, we didn't get some of those pros from the previous slide, like there was no class hierarchy, there was no way to really document this. In order for developers to use it, they already had to know what the XML was supposed to look like um, in order to know what they were going to be looking for. Um, so what I did instead um, went to the next level and defined a class for each element. And the way that I handled the uh, XML parsing was by, uh, you know, having different methods that uh, looked at all the XML each time. And then I uh, overwrote those methods each time I uh, extended the classes to do, uh, you know, specific marshalling and unmarshalling, you know, converting to and from XML. Uh, so, you know, that was, that was another approach. And then I decided, well, rewriting all of these methods is uh, kind of expensive. It's uh, certainly a lot of code. Can't I just use some sort of metadata inside the class and, and reuse generic parsing uh, logic? Um, so that's the solution we're at right now. I'll show you a little example of that. But I've also been thinking about something else. Um, so, you know, we have all these Google data services, and usually you're reading in Atom and sending back Atom to the server. Um, one of the options, if you are, are interested in JSON, you can actually request JSON data from the server, right? Right now the servers, uh, you know, they'll only accept Atom, so you're still going to have to generate this XML, but JSON can be easier to, uh, to parse. Um, you know, some, in some languages it's probably more efficient than uh, parsing XML. So that might be an option, too, is to always request data in JSON format and then use some sort of uh, JSON converter. Um, so I might be looking at that. I haven't made up my mind if that's, uh, if that's sort of uh, worth the effort. So um, thinking about this, this parsing model, just to show you sort of how this looks in Python, here's an example of uh, uh, some XML that you might see if you're working with contacts. One of the things you can put into Google Contacts is a contacts organization. So here's one, for example. Uh, inside the organization, you can have a, an org name and an org title and things like that. So um, in order to, to parse this XML, I defined a, a couple of Python classes. I'm just interested in the organization and then the org name underneath it. Um, so if you look first, we have the org name. It's, uh, it's actually very simple. It just has a uh, uh, a tag and a namespace I, I need to define for, for each uh, class that represents some piece of XML, some XML element in Python. I need to define the tag and the namespace that it belongs in. Um, and then it also has a text node, but, you know, that's just inherited from this, uh, from this atom base. Then we say there's an organization, which, once again, I'm doing this uh, tag and this namespace. Um, but in addition, it has a, an XML attribute and also a, uh, um, it also can contain an org name. So I def uh, specify that relationship by adding an entry to this uh, children. Uh, it's a dictionary or, uh, you know, associative array if, array if that's uh, terminology you're more familiar with. But um, so the idea was that this is how today I've sort of streamlined the process of having to create all these different classes that represent, uh, you know, all of these different XML schemas, all of these different elements that are part of the Google data uh, schemas and, and corpus of, uh, of tools. Um, so in the uh, original solution that I talked about before, this would be done with method overloading, and it was a lot more code. So if this seems like a lot, it's, uh, it's a big improvement. Um, so now let's move on to the second of the three components, which is auth, right? I, I showed at the beginning that was the first step. I was always having to authenticate or gain authorization. And uh, there's actually a talk on auth. Uh, if you want to get into specific details on just this topic, that's uh, at 4.15 later on today. Um, but there are basically three ways to... Uh, to authorize, authenticate, get authorization. Client login is where you send a username and password, and um, we showed that. That was the example in the, in the first two parts that I showed. And then the uh, next two are designed more for uh, browser and web applications. With uh, AuthSub, you're doing uh, browser redirects so that the user will log in on a Google page 
and then authorize your application to access uh, the specific data that you're interested in. Um, and then in, uh, for OAuth, that's another uh, uh, open standard that's being adopted um, across multiple different companies and services. Uh, they talked about that a little bit at the keynote, uh, some of the people who are interested in that. But that's something new which is uh, you know, being uh, added to um, the different Google services that we have. We're in the process of rolling that out. And uh, the idea here is that we're, we're taking things a bit farther than AuthSub. We're saying that um, in AuthSub, you have the registration to do secure mode where you're re registered and you're doing digital signatures on requests. With OAuth, we're requiring those. And uh, uh, this is something that's definitely helpful to have some libraries and some code that helps you do things like uh, you know, handle the public key to cryptography signatures and things like that. So um, if you're thinking of doing a library, uh, I think this is the one area which is kind of unique to Google. Um, if you were going to provide nothing else but just code that dealt with the Google-specific auth uh, mechanisms, you know, people can sort of handle the HTTP and the XML parsing and in a lightweight way if they want. But I think these login things, uh, I don't know that we have code for this in every language, uh, open source code. Um, so that might be something to, uh, to consider is... Uh, either looking for a solution or creating one if you feel up to it. So if we're talking about these different auth mechanisms, uh, here are some of the things you would need if you were looking at tools to, uh, to do this kind of thing. Um, you know, if you're doing client login, you need HTTPS um, to do that secure post where you're sending the username and password. Um, also in that, you're, you're doing a, a form escaping or form encoding uh, to format the data. Um, which curl actually handled for me, uh, both of those. But, you know, um, then if you're interested in secure mode, this is where it's really helpful to have libraries that handle the RSA or SHA-1 hashes. Um, we also use random number generators in Unix-style uh, epoch timestamps, right, where we represent the time as a long um, number there. Um, so as I've worked with off and you know I've been involved with a community of people using these services and uh, oftentimes when people first start working with auth you know there are some common pitfalls they run into like uh, quite a lot of confusion new lines in uh, HTTP headers right some of the tools will actually uh, you know you have to sort of strip what you get back from them so it's uh, one thing to keep in mind um, there are also some specific things like um, when you're doing auth sub, you're, you're looking for a specific scope, or uh, you know, uh, when you're doing authorization names, uh, when you're sending your authorization header, you're including this auth sub or Google login label along with your token value that you got back. Um, so there's there's some details in there that can trip people up. The the main point is down at the bottom here, and that is our, our accounts documentation is. Uh, is very helpful and uh, should have enough information for you to for you to build whatever you need to with that those uh, services. Okay, so now let's look at how I address this uh, in the Python library. Um, originally, this was just built into the client, and I decided later on that it made more sense to break it out as a separate module so it would be reusable. So if uh, Python's uh, the language you want to work with and uh, you don't want to use any of the rest of the library, you just want to say, well, I want to you know, not have to worry about this auth stuff, have, have some library to make it easier, um, just look for this gdata.auth uh, module. Um, the idea here is that it provides code for client login and auth sub currently and not yet OAuth, but uh, I've been looking at it just a little bit. Um, so that's, that'll be coming soon. Uh, so here's an example. I showed an example earlier, but if you were doing something with the uh, contacts API, for example, um, this is also kind of nice. It shows the interactive where you're actually asking them at runtime to enter their email address and password, and then uh, you're getting a token. Um, so across all these services, we're talking about making HTTP requests, right? I mentioned it was uh, CRUD operations, using HTTP calls, you're doing get, post, put, and delete. Um, and it's often helpful to have some kind of library that will, uh, will help you, you know, make these requests. 
And uh, you know, there are there are some things that you can add in addition that some of these libraries may not provide. Um, like sometimes common operations, you know, you can provide just a method that does something like create a new contact where you just have to say, here's their name, here's a list of email addresses and things like that. And it sort of uh, constructs all those things for you. Um, another thing, it could do some intelligent error handling, right? If you get a response back from the server, uh, those responses are often valuable, contain really useful information. Um, so that you might be able to maybe change some things to fit requirements, do some retries. Uh, might be possible that uh, you know there might be some network issue too, which would be a case in which you'd need to do a, a retry. Um, so for the uh, the Python example, right, the example where this sort of streamlines uh, streamlines things is if you uh, want to get a list of a user's contacts, usually you do an HTTP get on this particular URL that you know, has, uh, uh, you know, specifies that we're looking for contacts and here's their username and things like that. Well, in the uh, Python library, I've reduced it to just this, uh, this method call here. You're just saying get contacts feed and it, uh, it automatically figures out which headers are available and what's your authorization header and includes that, constructs the, the full request. Um, because when you're talking about Google Contacts, in order to get a user's uh, list of contacts, uh, we require that uh, your application is authorized to do that. Um, a lot of the feeds uh, require authorization in, in order to uh, read data, and all of them require authorization to be able to write. You know, they have to know who's, who's putting the data in there. Um, so there's the URL that we're actually getting against. And uh, then it parses the response, and it converts it into you know, a Python object, uh, like, like I had explained um, earlier on. Uh, so if you're looking at things that you want to be able to have in a library that you're using HTTP, um, you, know, you want something that can do uh, get and post at a bare minimum, um, include authorization headers. This is actually a problem in some uh, environments. Um, so that, that might be something you need to consider. Um, it's also helpful to be able to do additional HTTP headers, like, for example, uh, some services require additional tokens or additional information to be added into headers. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, the response codes that the servers send back are, are often very helpful, and uh, it's, it's good to have access to those, you know, to, to really see what the server has sent back. Um, oftentimes, if there's an error with your input, the server will actually tell you where it is or... Um, you know, if it didn't meet certain requirements, what those requirements are. Um, and then if you're doing a client login, right, we need HTTPS. So some of the best practices, uh, you know, once you have the tools and you're using your HTTP library, uh, one of the really uh, intelligent ways you can handle, you know, server responses is to follow redirects. Uh, the calendar service, for example, will sometimes uh, issue redirects when you make your first request. So it's good to just follow those automatically, you know, if, as long as there, uh, there aren't too many, right? You don't want to open up into a, an infinite loop. Um, another nice thing to do in these libraries I've found is to make your request modular. And what I mean by that is to take the HTTP code and sort of isolate it from everything else, you know, so that you can make atomic HTTP requests. Um, you could do something with asynchronous requests if you want to move on while, uh, you know, the, the request is processing in the background. Because oftentimes with your application, the HTTP, you know, round trip is, uh, is the most significant uh, wait time. Um, another thing that's nice is I know some people are working in environments where they have a proxy. Um, so it's good to have some support for proxies and maybe authentication uh, required proxies and things like that. Um, so in the Python library, the tool that I used was uh, HTTP lib mostly, and URL lib had some handy utility functions also um, for handling things like form and coding and things like that. Um, I also handle redirects uh, by doing a recursive call, for example, a get uh, to a calendar feed might issue a redirect. Well, I go ahead and call get on whatever it sent me. 
and uh, do that with a redirects remaining minus one. So I'll do like four redirects, I think, is the default, and then won't follow any more from there. Then it throws an exception. Um, another change which I made fairly recently was to make all of the HTTP request code completely modular. So there's one function that just handles HTTP requests. And the reason why this was important is because, you know, we released Google App Engine. And uh, while this isn't a talk about Google App Engine, I did uh, try it out and play with it, wrote a sample app that showed how to use the uh, Google Data Python library on App Engine. Um, the only thing was on App Engine, they use uh, a library, an API, called URL Fetch, right? They don't allow you to make direct uh, socket connections uh, when you're on App Engine. Uh, so they use this URL Fetch library. Well, I had to do some refactoring um, in order to make the, uh, the layer swappable so I could just swap in URL Fetch instead of HTTP lib and uh, be able to use it as normal. Um, so once I had done that refactoring work, it was really easy to use this. So uh, my advice would be do that kind of modularization work up front. Um, you know, especially if you uh, anticipate or maybe even don't anticipate different environments or different mechanisms to allow people to use maybe a different library to do HTTP requests. Um, and then it also has support for proxies. You can set this up with environment variables and there are several different ways you could make these requests. So the last point I really wanted to hit on was this idea of uh, community, specifically open source community and having a group of people involved in these libraries. Um, so we actually have open sourced uh, many of the libraries uh, that we use for interacting with Google Data Services. Um, this is the list of the official Google uh, written and Google provided libraries. There are others out there too. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, if there's one maybe for uh, for Ruby or things like that. That's one that I've heard a lot of requests for. Uh, ActionScript is another where I've heard quite a few requests for. Um, but there's, you know, your language of choice may not be up here. Um, so this would be a great opportunity is if you're writing something, consider making it open source. Consider sharing it with other people to work with. Um, there are a few uh, benefits of this. I mean, you may not need me to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, why I think it's a good idea to open source things. But um, since the Python library is open source, I've actually experienced all of these different benefits, right? There's a division of work. I actually haven't written all of the code in there. A lot of different people, both inside and outside of Google, have worked on this library. Um, there's more eyes to find bugs. We have an issue tracker as part of our uh, open source project hosting on uh, Google Code. Um, and uh, that's been really helpful. People are reporting bugs and following up and tracking them. Uh, another thing that's been great for me is uh, motivation to write really good code, right? At least, uh, you know, I hope it's really good. Um, you know, being very careful before I put something out there, realizing that anybody in the world can see this stuff. This isn't just going to stay locked away in my department or, or uh, you know, in my company. Um, another great thing is that it opens the door to unanticipated uses, right? You may have... Uh, written this code with a particular use in mind, but open source it and share it with people, find new people with new ideas coming in and uh, both enriching the design and, you know, it's, it's always interesting to hear what people are working on and using it for. Um, so this ties back into division of labor. The idea here is that if you really want to provide a comprehensive library, um, like we've tried to do with those uh, official languages that I mentioned before, there are a lot of services that, uh, you know, Google Data Services, um, some of these you may not be aware of, but uh, the list is growing too. Um, so with the, uh, with the Python library, uh, some of the things that I didn't have to write were things like uh, support for HTTP proxies and uh, various bug fixes. Um, there were also from that list before, you know, that long list of services, um, I covered a couple of them, but, and uh, some other people from Google pitched in and, and wrote ones for, uh, for some of the other services. But these three in particular were ones where uh, these were uh, implementations, libraries that were completely written by, uh, by people outside of Google, um, where they took 
you know, what I had written as a foundation and built on top of it for uh, those particular services. Um, so I owe uh, a lot to, you know, open source community and developers and uh, actually some of the people in this room. Um, so I see some more here. So with that, I'll turn it over to questions. And uh, you can also find more information, as always, on code.google.com. Um, and uh, if you guys wouldn't mind walking up to the microphones, um, I think we've got one in the middle there for, for questions. Or you can just shout them out. Yes. OAuth supported, is OAuth supported for Google Health was the question. And I'm actually not sure, so I don't want to, I don't want to say the wrong thing. So yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, that's an interesting question. The question was, uh, is the CCRG data in Google Health converted into JSON? Is that correct? Right, so I'm actually not sure on that either. Um, so I know, right, for, for most of the XML and the services, we provide a mapping where we convert the XML that you would have gotten as Adam into, uh, into JSON. But the uh, CCRG data is, you know, uh, we handle that a little bit differently, I think, in, in most cases, where we just sort of treat it like a blob of XML. So I don't know if we really parse that on, on, the, uh, on the JSON. Uh, producer, yeah, okay. Not sure on that either. <laughs> All right. Yes. So the original implementation, uh, Zend had uh, created, I think, almost completely on their own, and then a couple of couple of Google people got involved too, and and uh, worked with worked with them on uh, on that library. So I think. Um, there are a couple of guys who are really active on it right now from Google, and they're both here today, Ryan Boyd and uh, Johan Hartman. Um, I've, I've worked with them, so we talk a lot about the Python and PHP, you know, libraries together, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so the question was why is that one sort of through Zend as opposed to these other ones which we've just sort of open sourced on our own. And I think part of it was the benefit of working with the Zend community which is uh, very active and uh, you know, uh, having some of that hosted uh, with them. Yeah, it's been great working with them, so it's been a good, good experience. Yeah, right. Right. Um, question one, does Google do that? If I submit an unknown XML element to Calendar event, it doesn't come back. Right. So the question was, we're saying that when you're bringing in XML to the client, parsing it, you should preserve the unknown XML that you're getting in. Uh, but then when you send XML to the server that maybe the server doesn't anticipate or understand, why doesn't it preserve it, right? It uh, does it, does it, right. And in most cases it doesn't. There might be cases where it does. In most cases it does not preserve the XML that you send directly. Um, and, you know, that just sort of makes sense, I guess. Um, so, so for us, we think of it as, right, we're um, hosting this data. We have data and a lot of it is tied into the user interface or something like that. Um, I think in Google Calendar there is a way to preserve additional information through something called extended property elements, right? You were mentioning that. Um, so there are some mechanisms in some services where we sort of open this uh, this way of adding an additional markup, but generally we don't preserve the actual XML that's sent to the server. Yeah. So could you explain like, how you dealt with that in your library? I didn't exactly follow it. Sure. Okay, so the question was how did I handle that in, in our library? And it might help to, to look at the code here. 
So this is the open source project. And uh, I've been browsing some of the code here. Um, let me pull this up. There's, there's a, yeah, actually, that was the right file. Okay, so um, I have this core part of the library called uh, Atom. It's the Atom package, Atom module. And uh, inside of it, there's a generic class called Atom Base, which all of the other ones inherit from. So inside of Atom Base, there are all these uh, methods that I use for parsing the XML. And these are generic and reusable across uh, all the other services. So for example, there's convert element tree to member. So when I get, uh, when I get XML in as a string uh, from the HTTP library, I parse it using element tree. So that handles all of the uh, XML validation, namespace processing, all of, all of that logic. Um, and then I take that element tree and iterate over the nodes and uh, look for um, different matches for what I'm looking for. So for example, here, let me highlight some things. Let me make this bigger too. Yeah, so I look in, uh, in the class, the current class of the object that I have, and I look in this children list. If you recall back, it's a while ago now, but that uh, organization parsing example that I gave, right? I was uh, saying one of the children is org name inside of organization. So I look in this, uh, this dictionary and see if there's a match. And uh, if I go through and there are no matches, uh, then what I'll do is I'll, uh, let's see, where is it here? I'll uh, parse it using a, uh, uh, a method that converts it into an extension element. So let's look at that here. Yeah, so here's this extension element object. And the idea here is that you just pass in the tag and the namespace and the, the child uh, elements and the attributes. So this all gets parsed and turned into these sort of uh, generic uh, classes or generic objects which represent arbitrary XML. Um, so then these, this, uh, these classes here also have these same, uh, you know, methods. There, there's one called transfer to element tree where, you know, as part of the process of turning these objects back into XML, I'll create an element tree and start adding in these uh, new XML elements that I'm generating from these classes. And then um, there's also become child element where it's, uh, where it's adding itself underneath the object that you're giving it. Uh, so there's, there's a few of these uh, utility methods that are used across all these different services. So uh, across all these different objects inherited. Um, so in, in this case of the extension elements, there's a slightly different implementation for those because I don't know uh, sort of at uh, compile time what the tag is that I'm looking for, for example. Um, with this, it's completely dynamic. Yes, so the question was if, uh, if I just keep all of the XML that I get and just reinsert it. So the answer is yes, right? So uh, it really isn't used all that often, right? The, the main case would be uh, when you're using the library uh, for maybe a service where there's not a complete implementation, you know, because you can use this against any Atom Pub service. There are just specific handlers for uh, most of the Google services. Uh, not all of them right now, but yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? Yeah, right here. Yes. Right, so the, right, the question was uh, for using this with App Engine is the idea that you can use this library, uh, generate the XML that you need, and then store that right in the, in the App Engine data store. And the, uh, the App Engine data store actually is, a, is an object database. Um, it's not really worried about Atom XML. Um, usually you create a, a specific 
class uh, to represent uh, some kind of object that you're going to be storing in the, in the App Engine data store. Um, so the real place where I think this is useful is using, using this library on App Engine is if you wanted to write uh, a hosted application on App Engine which talks to some existing Google services, right? So you could create an App Engine app that uh, talks to Blogger or Contacts or, you know, any of those other services I listed that, um, you know, do, do some interesting mashups or, you know, integration of, you know, some of the user's data with uh, some new uh, functionality that, that your web app is bringing. So, yeah. That, that's sort of the way I see it being used, but of course there may be other ways I haven't anticipated. I think maybe one of the other things you could do with this is start with this library if you wanted to uh, um, create uh, your own Atom Pub or uh, Google Data type server, right? You wanted to expose some kind of uh, expose some feeds, you know, expose this CRUD functionality, um, and you happen to want to use Python, right? This might be a way you could you could get started. Okay, so I think we're about out of time. Um, there is a note. We have uh, feedback uh, evaluation forms and things like that, if you wouldn't mind filling those out and uh, let me know how it went. And uh, also, um, yeah, okay, I think that's it. So thank you very much.